We are beginning a new church series, and it's Church Matters. And so today, uh, we're going to be having all four pastors come. If you're visiting with us, this is not the normal format. Uh, normally, we have Pastor Paul coming and preaching an expositional message, and right now we are in the book of Luke. For the next four weeks, we're going to be, uh, all four pastors are going to be joining together. We do have a booklet. I'll call the ushers forward. If you did not receive one, we have more printed. You can grab one of these. This is the content you will need for the next four weeks as we go through it. Today, we plan on getting through page 10. The content is also going to be on the PowerPoint that's behind us, but for those of you especially with eyesight issues and sitting in the back, you'll want a booklet in front of you. Ushers can pass these out. It has been a year and a half in the making. Uh, the pastors have been meeting for some time. We've met with the deacons uh, concerning church matters and uh, the issues and things that we're seeing as we scrape and get into God's word. And today we actually want to present that to you in the next four Sundays. The booklets that you see in front of you, Pastor Paul uh, put together, and uh, he is the one that we were looking to to preach this series, and, and I think it's awesome that he said, no, let's get all the pastors up here. And so each of us are taking a segment, each of us are taking a part uh, of the booklet, of the uh, information in there, and teaching it to you. Your involvement, I've mentioned this in the, in the know the last few weeks, there are index cards right in front of you in the pew, uh, this is one way uh, that you can write a question and put it into the box at the end of the service or return it to the Welcome Center. There are boxes on the sides. These are for your offerings, but we're using them for these index cards as well. Right here in the front and then also on both sides in the back. As we're preaching, teaching through Scripture uh, the next four Sundays, as you see questions, as you say, boy, where does this text go? Uh, what do you mean by this? Write that down. Write it on the index card, put it in there. We're going to be responding and have a segment each week, uh, a part that you can discuss, and we're going to be giving and sharing those questions that you have. Not only that, there's live feedback. So we are giving you the option uh, for texting, and you can text back at the number on the PowerPoint behind us here on the screen. Uh, you'll be seeing a text number, and uh, all you have to do, text your question right to that number, and if it's a question we want to get to this week, We'll share it. If not, uh, we'll return and get it back the following week. Pastor Paul is going to be kicking us off with an introduction. And let me just mention, too, there's live internet in here this morning. So if you'd like to hook up to our internet via your telephone or your iPad or your Nook or your Kindle, whatever you have, we have internet, which will always be available now Sunday mornings, uh, or Wi-Fi is available. I should say it that way. Wi-Fi is available. So if you go on your little uh, machine there, It'll say uh, FAS Net SP. FAS Net SP is the uh, Wi Fi uh, one you want. And then the uh, password, I think, is John 316. John 316 with a capital J and a colon in there. John 3 colon 16 capital J. That'll get you on the internet or on our Wi Fi here this morning in the auditorium. I am excited about this. I want to introduce it to you. Thought about a number of things that I wanted to say to you this morning, but I, obviously time is limited and need to go fast. So on page two, if you open up in your little booklet there, Church Matters, let me just go through the letter that I uh, wrote here to kind of set this up for you. It remains our desire at faith to keep the church as closely aligned with the Bible as possible. That has always been. Uh, to me, that is the critical aspect of ministry, is how can we keep our church as closely aligned to the Bible as, as absolutely possible. Uh, and realizing this, we're all sinners, correct? Sinners always have a tendency to get off track. And, and so we have to constantly look at the Scriptures because the Scriptures, in essence, that is the track. And so we have to constantly say, where is our church in relation to the Bible? Sometimes we get off this way, this way, this way, and we just keep coming back to the Scriptures. And what I find over the course of time is that's what keeps the course, that's what keeps the church on track. So we want to do that. And then one of the great Baptist distinctives, I am personally, and I know all these guys are too, in, individually here as well. First of all, we're Christians who believe the Bible. Secondly, we're Baptists who believe the Baptist distinctives are critical distinctives over time. And, and I am, and I, I'll let them speak for themselves, but I know, I know they are. We're Baptists by conviction. And I say that 
proudly, to be honest with you, in a day when sometimes people make Baptists look bad, like Westboro Baptists. They're not Baptists, they're idiots. Uh, when they march and say God's, you know, uh, God hates queers and judgment on America, God doesn't hate queers. God, God loves everybody and, and offers salvation to everybody. So we don't go around saying God hates queers. We go around saying God died for all people. And so even though there's people that make the Baptist name look bad, we proudly wear the name Baptist. And uh, so one of the two of the distinctives that are going to be before you this couple of weeks with us, one is the sole authority of the scriptures. We believe that sincerely. We believe that the Bible is the sole authority for faith and practice. And that has been a distinctive of Baptists since, really since the Reformation when the whole Baptist movement began. No, Baptists don't go back to John the Baptist. I, I, I hate to break your, burst your bubble. Baptist is a movement that came out of England, and it really came out of the Reformation as well. And since that time, it has, they have developed a couple distinctives that grew out of the Reformation as well. So I, I consider us to be Protestants just like others who had distinctives that were unique to their group, one of them being the sole authority of scriptures. And that is in response to the Catholic Church who believes the church is the authority. We believe the Bible to be the authority. The second distinctive that's before you today is the autonomy of the local church. We want to try and teach that again because over the past couple of years, there's a lot of new people here at Faith now that have come in over time, and we want you to understand who we are and who this church is. And one of the great Baptist distinctives, along with uh, the Bible as our sole authority, is that we believe in the autonomy of the local church. Each local church governs itself. Now, again, that's, that's Protestant in its, in its foundations because it really is a reaction to Rome who has a pope that sits over there in Rome and governs the church. We don't believe that. We don't believe that there is some, you know, structure of archbishops and bishops and priests and all of that different stuff. Out of the Reformation came a group of Baptists that believed that there were elders, deacons, who were leaders in a church, and they also believed that each individual church had the right to govern itself as opposed to some central organization ruling the church. So these are historic uh, distinctives that really we, are, we believe and are committed to and have been for uh, really my entire ministry and my entire life really uh, has been in, in, a, in a Baptist church. Have we made mistakes? Absolutely. I remember my dad, when he uh, went through the mentoring processes, he's saying, you know, we're in the process of transitioning from his leadership to mine. He said this. He said, just pray you don't make really gigantic ones. And that, it, because everybody makes mistakes, right? Gotcha. The other thing I want to take you through real quick in this is, in, in this letter, at the last paragraph on page two, it says there are three aspects that we felt needed to be addressed. And when I say we now, I mean uh, all of us up here together. I really tried to articulate in paper, and in, particularly in this letter, uh, opening letter, what we felt. And that was we felt that there's some things that need to be addressed. One is the church as a body and its authority needed to be understood by all its members. I don't know, and may, I, I, I hope I find out during courses, I wonder if you understand the full authority and the full weight of your authority as a congregation and as a body. The final authority for everything that takes place here outside the bounds of Scripture is you. Not as an individual, but as a group of people as a church, as a local church. And we wanted to come, and during this particular session, we wanted to emphasize your role in this so that you not only see as we move toward what we call biblical eldership, but we wanted you to understand your position and your place in this because your place is very critical to this whole process as well. Secondly, and this has been ongoing on page three, second paragraph down, second, we needed to realign our deacon ministry. Deacons serve a vital role in the local church by caring for the physical needs of the church. And over the past few years, 
We have restructured and reorganized the deacon ministry here at Faith. That's something that after Pastor John left and Pastor Tim left, and uh, as we've gone through transitions in the last four years that have been five years that sometimes have been very difficult transitions. And, you know, I know you've felt something, what I felt, is this church ever, is the engine ever going to get moving? You come in and you feel like, is it ever going to get going? Well, you know, the thing that was going on that most of us didn't realize was God was laying a brand new foundation for the future. And it's very exciting. And part of that is we needed to go into our deacon ministry. We needed to restructure our deacon ministry. And we've done that. And right now the deacons are functioning as deacons. And they're really doing a great job. They care for the physical needs of the place. Finally, it's time to realign our pastoral ministry. And uh, the words in the Bible for a pastor, you rarely read the word pastor in the Bible. You usually see elder or bishop. These three words, elder, overseer, pastor, are one office and reflect the responsibilities of the office. Elder is the title, overseer is the office, and pastor is the work. Now, the biggest question that you're probably going to have is this. And whenever we make changes here at Faith, and, and, and you're always making changes, and honestly, as you go into the future, you always do make changes. And pastoring is leading a church through ongoing change. And the reason is because the culture keeps changing. And we never change the message, but we change methods from time to time. And not from time to time, we change methods a lot. Because culture, and you're living in a day when culture is changing a lot. And, and, and uh, you have, th there has to be relevance without compromising Scripture. But the question I get asked in, in, as we make changes is, does that mean we've been doing it wrong all these years? And I, and I want to, no, it doesn't. And I thought, as I thought back about this, I thought when faith was started, some 53 years ago, there was just a man and his wife and a kid <laughs> who at that time was in the nursery. Uh, and uh, out of that was just a pastor and 29 people that were willing to go along for a ride that honestly, none of them had any idea what God was going to do. And I often think my dad always said this, I never dreamed what God would do with Faith Baptist Church. Uh, he said, I envisioned a church of 100 people just ministering here in our community. And before we knew it, is this, this thing just took off and for all these years has been just going, putting out pastors, putting out uh, workers, and just sending people out ministry all over. I just talked to another one this week, another kid from our, another kid from our church here is going to plant a church in the Northeast. Another grew up here, going to plant another church. Everybody said, Amen. oh, you are just going to another church planted. But the senior pastor model that started back then, it started because of what we were. And faith was structured, as were most churches in the day and time, with a senior pastor model. And the senior pastor model was a departure from the roots of our Baptist history. That's what's really interesting to study. If you go back past the last 90 years of church history in America, you'll find that the senior pastor model was a departure from our roots way back. And what we're asking you to do and going to ask you to do, because ultimately at the end of this, you're going to vote on this and you are the final authority, is we're asking you to return to our roots. And I think in returning to our roots, return to a position that is closer aligned with Scripture. So the senior pastor model is primarily an American concept, rarely seen around the world and rarely seen in any other denomination. And so, was it, were we wrong? No. In the early days, it's how it started. It grew out of that. In some cases, our church and churches, and I don't mean just our church, adopted a CEO model of a pastor. And you've heard that if you followed the church growth movement in America. You've seen where the, the pastor really is a CEO. And, the, and, and honest to goodness, the pastor isn't a CEO. The pastor is an, the pastor is an elder, he's a bishop, and he's an overseer. And so, we want to just walk you through it. So, why change? Because I don't think, I think we need to just more carefully line up with Scripture. And so our task in these couple weeks is to walk you through the Bible and show you biblically that we're changing. We're not changing because other churches are changing. We're changing because we want to be closer aligned to the Bible. And I hope as we walk you through that what you see is that we are just laying out the Bible for you and saying, here's the Bible, here's where we need to be. And so that's our desire in these next couple weeks.
Okay, so as we uh, start in on part one, what is the church? It's important to understand what do we mean when we say the church? The church is the New Testament. In the New Testament means, uh, let's start all over. The church is the New Testament means of God building his kingdom. There's two aspects of this. And we're going to look at in a minute the universal versus the local church. Matthew 16, 18, the words of Christ. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Being a former Catholic, that was the verse I was taught as a Catholic, that that's what made Peter the first pope. That is not what Christ is saying here. Christ is saying that through Peter, he was going to use Peter, and Peter would begin to proclaim the message of Christ. The church would be built on the message of Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ. In other places in scripture, we see Christ referred to as a chief cornerstone. So the English word church in the New Testament translates the Greek word ekklesia, which means assembly or congregation. It never refers to a building. It is a called out group of people, people who have placed their faith in Christ for salvation. Number three, we see that the church is the people who belong to the Lord Jesus Christ by means of salvation. So again, as you look at that word, as it's used in scripture, it's used in a context. One of the ways it is used as, as a called out group of people, not confined by walls or location. This is the universal church. Look at Ephesians 1.22, and he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church. So again, is there someone 7,000, 8,000 miles away that belongs to the same church that I belong to if they are indeed a believer? And the answer is yes. We're not confined by walls. We're not confined by tradition. We're not confined by philosophy or perhaps different ways that we may worship. We're not confined by that. We are all part of the universal church, Christ being the chief shepherd. So there's the universal church, anyone who has placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. Now, let me throw a trick question out to you. Are there people who are part of the universal church that are not Baptists? <laughs> Some of you had to actually think about that. <laughs> yes, there are. There are. Now, let's look at the local church. So you have the universal church solely based on people, not buildings, people who have been saved, who have placed their faith in Christ for salvation. But then there is the local church, Acts 8.1, and Saul approved of his execution, referring to uh, uh, Stephen there when the stoning was happening, and there arose on that day a great persecution against the church, notice, in Jerusalem. Well, now scripture is starting to, to give us this idea of there, there is a called out group of people, not just a universal, but now they are meeting in a particular uh, geographical location. Persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. In Acts 9.31... We see, so the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. Again, a, a, a geographical area where these believers are congregating, worshiping God, doing the Great Commission, and proclaiming the gospel. So you have the universal church, then you have these geographical churches. 1 Corinthians 16, 19 says, the churches of Asia send you greetings. Very particular location. Aquila and Priscilla together with the church in their house. There again, a particular geographical location send you hearty greetings in the Lord. So what, what, what's the concept here? The church is made up of all those who have, placed, who have been placed into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit at the point of salvation. That is the most fundamental, most important thing to understand. 
Who is a part of the church? Those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, I want to take a look at that passage. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 13. There we have, for just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. The church is made up of those who have been placed in the body of Christ through faith in Jesus Christ. The second statement there, the church is that body of believers who meet to worship. Now the emphasis here we're looking at is more locally. Partake of the ordinances and fulfill the Great Commission. Example, faith at Sellersville is one of those local bodies meeting to do just that. So you have the universal, then you have the local. As Paul mentioned, we're taking us through and really giving us small steps, stepping you through this process. So you might say, oh, I know what a church is. I know we're a local body. No, we just want to make sure the foundational truths are given to you. This next step, bottom of page five, as we get into part two, descriptions and pictures of the church. These are not things, if you have been in church for some time, these are not things that are new to you. But boy, as we get into some of these passages, the meaning of a church member so stands out. Let's do that. There's seven words I'm going to ask you to circle, so if you have a pen, you can have that ready. Descriptions and pictures of the church, the bride of Christ. Ephesians 5, 25 through 30, husbands, love your wives. So we see this is a marriage commitment is the first illustration that's given. Husbands, love your wives. And of course, we ask the question, well, how? Okay, you just say that. How? Guess what? The whole next section tells us what that looks like. As Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, Christ died on the cross for us, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. So our groom, as a church, we're talking about a, a local body, but it is a body of believers that are unified together. We look to God's view as one, each of us apart. But God's view, each of us is one. And how does it look that we are in this sanctification, right? It says here that he might sanctify her. It tells us right after, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. Now, I was a kid once. And I got very dirty in my backyard at times. And my mom would just take the hose. You know what I mean? Forget the shower. You take the hose and you clean the feet off, you clean the guck off before you go in the house. Here, what's going on is this is the same picture. It's a cleansed her by the washing of water. Look what the detergent is. Look what that soap is. Look what is the cleaning thing. This is why scripture is so important and will never be taken away from the central part of our church with the word. You see here that the word of God having liberty in the heart of a spirit-filled believer causes that sanctification process, that growth process. That's what we see. That's what Christ, our groom as a church, is doing in us. Why? Why is that happening? So that he might present the church to himself. He, Jesus Christ, is the agent the actual emphasis here is not on the bride, although many times we think of it that way. It's on the one presenting. That he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Page six. You know, the day 14 years ago that I got married to Jennifer, the doors opened in the back of the church. I am standing at the front of the church, and down the aisle, she comes absolutely stunning, absolutely beautiful. And my love was so strong for her at that point and so meaningful, right? You've been there, for those of you that have been married, for some that will soon. 
But you know, 14 years later, she is more beautiful to me now. And the relationship that we have is so far beyond the love we thought that we had back 14 years ago because of what has taken place in the, in the process. What really is that that happened in my relationship with my wife? You see, unconditional love, which is supposed to be in marriage, unconditional love has grown. And my friends, in this passage, we see the groom comes to us, literally, Faith Baptist Church, all of us that are members here, and says, by the word of God, we are cleansing you, and our love has grown. Do we want to go back 50 years ago to meeting in the hall and all? No, we are here. God is ready to move. And God is ready with us as members, cleansing us, working us through by the word. And then we get into actually a husband and wife relationship and it says, in the same way husbands should love their wives as their own bodies, he who loves his wife loves himself, for no one has ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. So it's, it's a conversation on that husband-wife relationship. Listen, I love going shopping with my wife. I do. I'm one of those weird guys, I guess. And I love going shopping with my wife. You know why? Because I get to, when she goes, you know, in there and she starts putting on all the clothes, I'm out there grabbing all, a whole bunch more stuff, throwing, hey, try this on, try this dress, try this. And she, I can actually shop her out. I don't like shopping for me. I love shopping for her. Why? I get to benefit from her. Benefit. I get to see her in it, right? You know what it is? That's the same thing God, Christ, is doing for us. As a church, he wants to see us grow. He is doing that as he cleanses us and washes us each and every Sunday as we get word proclaimed to us, as individuals, as that word comes out. God works in that way. Why? Then the last part here, just as Christ does the church, and now we're back to, oh, now we're off of husbands and wives. Back to the Christ. Just as Christ does the church, because we are members, circle that word, members of his, circle this word, body. We are members of his body. The actual Greek construction here takes the word members. It says we are members. It's actually not correct. It's actually members we are of his body. The emphasis is on the member. That's, that's very important because, guess what? I am a church member. You are a church member. Each one of us, this is talking about united as a whole, but each one necessary. That leads us to our next part. Each one essential to the whole. The body of Christ, Colossians 1.18. And he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. 1 Corinthians 12.27. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Let's look at these two verses. It says here, and he, that's Christ, is the head of the body. Circle that word body. So here again, we now we see a different picture coming through. First picture, bride and groom. Now this picture, a body. I'm not going to go long into this section because Paul has taught on this many times. The body, the hand is necessary, the foot is necessary. We get that idea as a church, how necessary each essential part is to a body, right? The flowing of blood to each part as we work. But something interesting just to point out in this passage and it says it here in the Corinthians passage, now you are the body of Christ. My friends, we're here together not because of what we get coming in, but because of who we are given to, and that is Christ. We are part of his body and individually members of it. There's actually the last section, if you look it up actually in your Bible, the last section of this verse is missing, and it's very important. It says, and God has placed us uh, place these in the church. You are here, my friend, not because you wanted to come. You wanted to be a member of the church. God placed you into this church for this time, for this purpose. In fact, if you think of it this way, we are here. We are a member. We cannot have any member not working on my body. Uh, that doesn't make sense. 
My foot moves because I make it move. My hand moves because I make it move. In the same way, an inactive member is an oxymoron. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't even go. Inactive is not part. As a body, you need to have each part flowing, each part working as a whole. And we see our next picture. It moves right into the household of God, Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but are fellow citizens with the saints and members, circle that word member, of the household of God. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you are also being built together into a dwelling place, circle that word, new word here, dwelling place, for God by the Spirit. One section here to point out to We are members united as a whole, but take a look at this part here in the latter part of these verses, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. What is Faith Baptist Church in the eyes of God? It is a holy temple. We're not talking about a building. The actual word used here, as you go into the Old Testament, you have the the temple. We're talking about the tabernacle, the temple that was being David built the temple. This word here is actually talking about the inner temple sanctuary. The innermost part, you take your mind back to the Old Testament, the Holy of Holies. So what happens here is we are growing together. My friends, we are members together, growing together as a body into God's inner sanctuary. Right here, right now. So much so that this building itself is not necessary for us to be Faith Baptist Church. Wipe it out, my friends. It is gone. We are in God's eyes, his church, because we are people here together. We see here that it is a marriage commitment, use of the body, and a family household view. 1 Timothy 3.15, If I delay that you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, we now move into our last, or our second to last section here, the pillar and buttress of the truth. You could actually take out, wipe out the words of the living God out of that passage, and it would make a little bit more sense with what the pillar goes back to. It's actually an apposition going back to church, which is the church, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Our church is what God's view is where scripture and truth is to be found for this world. Here. But guess what? Again, it is not this place. It is not this ground. It is not this building. It is you and I. It is us as church members coming and focusing and being that truth as we are lights to the world. And it's not where the church is, but who the church is. It leads us immediately to our last section, which is the proclaimers of the truth. You see, because we are joined together, you and I as members, our family, acting each as individual parts of this body, united in an unbelievable relationship as we together are the bride to Christ, When that happens, when we realize our our position, what do we want to do? We want to talk about it. Proclaimers of the truth. 1 Peter 2, 9, but you are the chosen race, holy priesthood or royal priesthood, holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him. There it is right there. Who are we talking about? Why are we here today? What are we learning about? It's Jesus Christ. Who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. You see, a true understanding of our relationship with Christ, the grace, as Paul mentioned, the goosebumps that he got earlier, the grace that we have through Christ and we understand our relationship and membership one to another, we just want to talk about it. We just want to tell other people. We just want to proclaim the truth. 
It's not, I'm going to go knock on doors and soul win for God now because I have to. It's, I'm going to work. I am in town. I have my neighbors. I am communicating because I get to in that relationship. A few points in conclusion. For one, we are all one. And in doing so, in saying that, there is no one that is emphasized in this building, in this place, in our church, more than any other. So my friends, we are members. We're members here to serve. We have Doug Weiss, who is the head of our deacons. A very important position. But guess what? Doug Weiss is no more important in this church than a friend of mine who is a member of this church who is not here this morning because she can't come. She would love to be here, but she can't. She's at home, probably sitting on her lazy boy right now. She watches us by video on the web on her new Kindle Fire. She's sitting there because of cancer is eating her body. And so she's getting dialysis done. And so Ruth Ryren is such an important part of this body. Why? She's a member. She is a part. Just as much as any of these guys sitting right up here, Doug, Ron, Paul, they're a member. Just like all of you. Just like Doug Weiss. Just like Ruth. And many others, unfortunately, that are not able to join us today. So why is membership so important? We see it here in Scripture. I mean, we just circled it how many times? Body, member, all this. We are church members. We are to act like church members. We're to love. When somebody is not going to be with this body, we are to show love there. When somebody comes and joins, like we had five new ones join recently, we are to love. They are now new parts to this membership. It's not a country club. This is not a place where we come because we get to get something out of this. This is a functioning member part of the body, functioning in the part that we get to serve. One of those new people that just joined, Tom Gary, sent me an email just this past week saying, hey, Paul, I know now that I'm a member of this church, but I'm going to be active in doing something. I want to serve. So I'm going to leave it up to all the elders, the pastors of the church, to tell me where can I serve best? What can I do? That is a heart that sees the need and the true meaning behind membership, behind being a member, being in God's body. The question is how can I best serve my church? A study has done that one-third of churches have basically what you call the oxymoron, the inactive members. One third. A church of 300, you have about 100 people that act as a biblical church member. I'm going to end with a verse. And we've been talking many, many times here in, in the book of Ephesians in these illustrations. Ephesians 3.20 says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than we can ask or think. Now I know these pastors up here, they, they have a lot of ideas of what they can ask God to do. But guess what? God has greater ideas for Faith Baptist Church than we can even believe and fathom. How is that accomplished? According to the power at work within us. You see, as we humble ourselves, as we pray, as we truly seek God, it says here in this verse that his power then works through us to accomplish unbelievable things that we can't even fathom as a member. And what does that look like? Well, to him be glory in the church. This is the illustration of the bride. In the church and in Jesus Christ. Throughout all generations. We have a lot of generations sitting here. Older, younger. The mixing of these generations together is so important. And we're going to look to do that this summer. We as a church are looking to bring glory to God in the church. In Jesus Christ throughout all generations, forevermore, as a church member, we are part of that. I hope you were able to see the pictures given and what that picture truly means to us. Hey, guys, would you mind if some of these people out here emailed us more this week saying, how else can I serve? I, I, we, we can get you plugged in. 
We can serve. We have places for your involvement. And it's not just about that. Your giving, your love, your part for this church family is needed. Why? God wants this church as his bride to work and to live and to be strong for him. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Paul. By the way, Tom Gary, your uh, nursery duty starts next week, so we'll see you down there. So you got to be careful just leaving it up to us. So um, we want to... Uh, we want to go through uh, some uh, basic principles. Again, as a reminder, if you, um, if you have any questions, the more we get into some of the practical outworkings of uh, church governance and how things are going to be adjusted and changing here, I know you're going to have questions, and so I really want to challenge you guys to get those questions to us because we want to answer those. Uh, we've been spending quite a bit of time with uh, the uh, deacons. Did this mic get turned off? Yeah, Bobby did his job, so good job, Bobby. Is it the monitors? Okay. Bring the monitors down. I'm just like... <clears throat> Yeah, so we'll figure it out. Um, then uh, I sound great. I sound great now, um, but uh, yeah, we're we're trying to work with the two microphones off. I'm working off the same transmitter Bobby was on, so him musically and me speaking. I could sing sing it. Maybe that would help. But, um, um, I'm good. We'll be all right. Um, I may come. I come down to the floor here. Actually, get away from the monitors. All right. Um, no, that's worse. All right. I'll just stand up here. All right. We have some, we have, uh, some principles I want to go through and we're going to touch on. And uh, then, uh, um, and then we'll, we'll be done today. Uh, if, if you go to the uh, concept of church governance. Okay, so we've talked about this concept of a church and how it's individual members that form one body, right? And so there's no single member that's more important than another. And Paul went through all of that. But at the end of the day, there is governance, all right? There is structure, all right? There is leadership. So, so the church doesn't just kind of idly go by and without any direction. There's leadership. There's governance. There's people who, who set vision, who set policies, who set procedures, all right? But at the end of the day, there is a body that, that makes it all happen, okay? And so, uh, one of the big issues that we're going to be adjusting and talking through is going to be governance, okay? And, uh, um, here, let me just pull this off, and I'll just grab, I'll grab this mic. This was, uh, I should be on, number 13. We good? All right, better. Okay. So, if you go to principle number one, most important aspect regarding church governance is right here, this statement here. The church is governed by who? Christ. It's not governed by us. It's governed by Christ. It's not governed by you. It's not governed by the majority. It's governed by Christ. This is why the scriptures will refer to him as the head of the church. They refer to Christ as the chief shepherd. All right? So Christ governs his church. In the first century, this was carried out through the apostles. Today, Christ rules through the words of the apostles as they are recorded in scripture. So Christ, as, as he governs his church, he's given us the scriptures. So we have the New Testament... And in the New Testament, you find structures, you find positions, you find offices, you find the concept of the church. So what we want to do is we want to say, Christ, how can we submit to your leadership by examining your word as closely as we can and then making ourselves look as close to that as possible? And that's the heartbeat behind what we're doing today and uh, throughout uh, these changes that you're going to see happen here at Faith. Therefore, every effort will be made to conform to Scripture procedures and spirit of the church governance as closely as possible, New two Testament guidelines. I basically just said that. Um, if you go down to principle number two, understand this, the ministry of the church, therefore, if Christ is our chief shepherd, we all submit to him. The ministry of the church is primarily the work of the members, and Paul hit on that pretty heavily, in the activity of worship to God, care for one another, and witness in the world. So while we submit to Christ, we come together as one body to accomplish our mission. See, the amazing thing about the church is in Christ together, we find a common mission. We worship, we care, we witness, we make disciples. That is the mission of the church. 
Matthew 28, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. That's the command of Christ, our chief shepherd. And so we've been given our mission. However, internal structures for church government, governance are not the main ministry of the church, but are necessary for equipping and mobilizing the saints for the work of the ministry. So the internal structures of the church that were set up by Christ as they were relayed through the Apostle Paul in the Scriptures are necessary to, to get the church functioning properly and maintain that proper function. All right, when there's, a, when there's a, an absence of effective leadership, when there's an absence of, of organized structure within the church, the church church will suffer, and the church will not be effective in accomplishing its mission. And so what we want to do is we want to have an organized structure that reflects the first century church because that is the way it was set up by the apostles. And so we want to get as close to that as possible so that we can be as effective as possible in accomplishing the mission of our church. And so governance is not the main ministry, but it is absolutely crucial and necessary to the effectiveness of a church in culture. And so principle number three then, governance structure should be lean and efficient to this end, not aiming to include as many people as possible in office holding, but to free, and this is important, and fit as many people as possible for ministry in the world. I can't tell you how many committees have ruined churches over the years. All right? Everything's got to go through committee. Well, nobody agrees. So then everybody fights over everything and nothing ever gets done. What we want to do is we want to appoint people in leadership positions who have the authority to carry out their specific tasks so that we can move forward with the mission and the vision that God's given us. And so understanding your role, understanding my role is crucial to the advancement of the church. And what we want to do is we want to have structures that are lean, that are efficient, that are biblically structured so that we can move forward and uh, free you guys to accomplish some pretty amazing things for God. All right, moving on to principle number four. Principle number four. Christ is the head of the church, and spiritually all his disciples are on level ground before him. Again, this was emphasized. Each having direct access to him and responsibility to intercede for the good of all as a community of priests. 1 Peter 2.9 says this, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, talking to the believers, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So as I listened on the radio coming in, as they just ordained two or three new priests, and the comments was, was made in the report that now you have been commissioned to be a priest unto the people representing Christ. No, that is all of us. That is all of us. All of you are a priesthood of Christ if you are indeed a believer. Level ground for all of us. Principle number five, God has ordained the existence of officers in the church. This is not a man-made concept. Some of whom are charged with the leadership of the church under Christ. 1 Timothy 5.17, just want to look at that one. Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. There you see the office is established, the leadership from the elders is clearly seen there in Scripture, and we'll talk about this later down the road, but there's even a distinction here because he says, especially those elders who labor in preaching and teaching. What is implied there, there are other elders who are focusing on something else. But what we see, God has ordained the offices or the officers in the church. Look at principle number six. Under Christ and his word, the decisive court of appeal in the local church in deciding matter of disagreement is the gathered church assembly. And again, Paul hit a lot on this, the importance of you as being part of this body implied first in the fact that the elders are not to lead by coercion, but by persuasion and free consent. So he warns the elders, do not rule 
by coercion or persuasion. This is not, this is not our company, <laughs> and we're going to sway things in a way that we want it to go. No, no, no. You don't rule that way. You are entrusted to shepherd the flock among you and to do that in humility, relying on the grace of God. Also what we see, second, in fact, in the fact that elders may be censored. The Bible talks about people bringing accusations against an elder, that don't let that happen unless in the presence of uh, two or more witnesses. In other words, the elders are not untouchables. I remember, I remember a long time ago when I left the Catholic Church and began to talk to a particular priest. He looked at me, and after engaging in some conversation, he said, Son, it is not your place to question the Catholic Church. And at the age of 17, I walked out of that church. It is your place and your God-given right as being a part of this body to question any one of these men, including myself. Amen? Sometimes there's a mentality, well, that's what the pastor said, we can't question him. No, 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 we are all part of the body. Third, in the fact that Matthew 18, 15 to 20, and 1 Corinthians 5, 4, depict the gathered church assembly as the decisive court of appeal in matters of discipline. So again, you see this level ground idea implied in the whole Matthew 18, which is the, the passage we often use for confronting a brother in the Lord who, who is walking in sin and we're trying to you know, get restoration in his life. You see throughout Scripture this one bodiness, yet those who are called out to lead the body, but yet still have this interaction with the body being held accountable by the body. Page 9, in your notes, principle number 7, dovetailed perfectly with, with what Ron had just said here. Uh, not much of an explanation is necessary as we read this. The local church should call and dismiss its own leaders, implied in the preceding concept. So that's where, and that is the health that what has been done in our church all along the way takes a church vote uh, and takes the church vote for dismissal. Page 10, principle 8. The leaders of the church should be people who are spiritually mature, an exemplary, gifted for the ministry, having a sense of divine appointment, are in harmony with the biblical qualifications of the church, and Bible passages are listed. One passage I just want to pick out quickly and, and uh, have a little part of an explanation is 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 13. There's a part at the beginning of this section here in 1 Timothy uh, which talks about this sense of divine appointment. And it uses the word desire, that there is a desire placed in, in leadership, in uh, pastoral leadership. It's the word orego. means to stretch oneself out, to reach in a passionately longing for. I can tell you this. I do remember sitting at Bob Jones in, in school, and, and they were going through as a class of preacher boys about this size, about this many people, and they said... If you are sitting out here and you're thinking of going in ministry and you think you can do anything else and be happy with it, go and do it. And I remember sitting there thinking, no, there's nothing else that I want to do. This is what God has called me to do. This is where I want to be. And I know there's times, and these guys up here can say it, that there are times as pastoral staff that you just like shake your head and say, what am I doing here now? Why am I putting up with this? This is crazy. Um, but God has called men to this task. There is an innate desire. And qualifications, as is mentioned here, leadership should be spiritually mature. Uh, looking through the qualifications, we will be doing that uh, coming up, I believe, next week. Principle number nine, spiritual qualifications should never be sacrificed for technical expertise. For example, deacons, financial property administrators should be people with a heart for God, even more importantly than experts in that field. Of course, best if both worlds could be fit. Uh, point is not to bring on a person as a pastor of the church just because they are a great CEO of their company. Does not make them a pastor with a pastor's heart. Just because that person has an expertise in the financial world doesn't mean that they would be a great deacon to oversee the, the, the uh, ministry of this church financially. Uh, the point is, the spiritual emphasis is much more important and much more needed. Best if both can be fit, for sure, but the spiritual emphasis is so needed. 
And let me close. Uh, let me close down today with the final two points here, because uh, very critical for you to understand one thing: we're not a business; we're a church. We're not structured like businesses are structured. We're structured the way the New Testament says the church is to be structured. We live by faith, not by sight. And we walk by faith, not by sight. And what does it mean to have faith? It means to put your confidence in someone other than yourself because we come to realize that we don't have in ourselves what is necessary to accomplish what needs to be accomplished. So we walk by faith, not by sight. We trust in God every day. And as you walk through this, I just think it's important for you to understand we're not a business. We're not a business. We don't, do, we don't operate by business principles. We operate by biblical principles because we're a church. And part of that is the selection of leaders in the church. And so principle 10 is the selection process should provide for the necessary assessment of possible leaders by a group able to discern the qualifications given in Scripture and that the process provide for final approval by the congregation of all officers. I assure you as we stand here today that in a couple of weeks we're going to ask you, we uh, call for a business meeting and, then, and another one in uh, August. We're going to walk you through this as we continue to work through it, and you've got to vote on all this stuff. We need your approval. The thing we need you to see as leaders is it's biblical. But part of what we'll do as we structure and walk through in the next couple of weeks the restructuring of how we want to set things up is you've got to know this. You're the one that's going to vote. Any leader that becomes an elder in our church, you're going to vote. You're going to vote. You have to approve it. So what has to take place is there has to be a group of people, and I think you're looking here and possibly some others that say this person has, this person possesses all the gifts necessary for the office. We will work with that person. We will look at that person. We'll scrutinize that person and then come to you and say, we believe this is an individual qualified for this position. You got to vote. So there has to be a means whereby we continue to look out from our midst those that have the ability, or not even the ability, those that possess the giftedness to perform function or offices in the church, which is really uh, members, deacons, and pastors. You vote in every new member, you vote in every deacon. You vote in every elder. You'll continue to do that. That's, there just needs to be a process. But when new members, we make sure they're saved. We bring them before you. You vote. Deacons, there's a process. You vote. Pastors, elders, there's a process. You vote. The last thing is there are no terms of service for church leadership in the New Testament. God gifts the church with people needed to serve through leadership. I often ask, why, why was it that deacons had terms of four years? I think they set it up after the office of the President of the United States. Or maybe it was the House of Representatives, and sometimes we look at deacons as they're like the House of Representatives. You don't find that stuff in the Bible. There are no offices. There, there are no uh, terms of office in the Bible. There's offices in the Bible. God gifts his church with what's necessary for the church to function as it should function. There are no terms. That's, that's, where, that's part of the corporate thing. That's part of the American capitalistic structure being brought into the church. And we don't operate by the Constitution of the United States, although we're grateful for it, right? We operate by biblical principles. So... We're not going to suggest to you, we don't, deacons here, there are no terms of office here in this ministry. Uh, there aren't. There, are we free to leave? I can resign tomorrow if I choose. Deacons can resign. You can resign as a church member. Uh, it's, it's, there are no terms. It's your people that God gifted and put here. The deacons are people that God gifted and put here, and elders are people that God gifted and put here so that the church can be the church so that it can do what it's designed to do. Now, we'll take you a step further. Each week, we want to walk further into the process. So uh, text us your questions. You can do that throughout the course of the week. That text is available all week. Or drop them in the things as you go out. Or feel free to come talk to any of us as well.